Good evening and welcome. My name is Susan Drodge and I am the Director of Advancement here at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Entrepreneurship in Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences event. This is our first Alumni Networking and Education Series event held in conjunction with- My name is Susan oh, Drodge. Oh no, uh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback there. Held in conjunction with the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy's Center for Practice Excellence, and we are very excited to be working with them. These and other alumni events are brought to you by our Office of Advancement and Alumni Relations as part of the faculty's alumni programming. We invite you to stay up to date on all upcoming alumni offerings by visiting pharmacy.utoronto.ca and our alumni Facebook page and LinkedIn groups. Before we start this evening, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendant, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This evening's event will provide an opportunity to hear from our alumni panelists about their journey to becoming successful entrepreneurs. This event will consist of a roundtable discussion with our panelists, followed by a question and answer period. Please feel free to add your questions in the live YouTube chat. Our panelists represent a vast array of expertise from various industries, and we are thrilled to have them with us this evening. Joining us is Mike Sullivan, CEO at Cubic Health, Sarai Chichik, co-founder and CEO at LSK Technologies, Livia Guo, co-founder and COO at LSK Technologies, Michael Doe, CEO at Medicist, and John French, Director, University of Toronto Entrepreneurship. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Zubin Austin is a professor and the Mar Murray Koffler Chair in Pharmacy Management at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy and the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on the professional and personal development of the healthcare workforce. He has published over 225 peer-reviewed papers and authored four textbooks, including the recently published Human Resource Management in Pharmacy, and that was commissioned by the American Pharmacists Association. In 2017, in recognition of the global impact of his work, he was installed as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, which is one of the highest honors for health researchers in Canada. He is also the only University of Toronto professor ever to have received both the President's Teaching Award for Sustained Excellence as an Educator and the President's Research Impact Award for the societal significance of his work. He has been named Professor of the Year by students on 20 separate occasions. I'd now like to welcome our listeners, our panelists, and Professor, Professor Austin. Zumit, I will now hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to everybody tonight for attending this session. It is sometimes said that a profession that cannot produce its own leaders and entrepreneurs will not last as a profession very long. And this is arguably the state of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences in 2022. My hope is that today, in conversation with the entrepreneurs we have the privilege of speaking with at this session, we are going to learn a lot more about the entrepreneurial spirit and perhaps see some of you in the audience consider your futures in a different light. I'd like to welcome and thank all of our panelists for joining us today. And we're gonna go ahead and get started now. It might be a funny way to start, but I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to uh, explain why are you here? Who are you? Could you maybe walk us through where your educational and career journey has taken you and why you're sitting today on this panel about entrepreneurship? Let me start with my friend, Mike Sullivan. Thanks, Zubin. Uh, I'll try to be as concise as I can here. Uh, it's interesting to be able to frame this from the point of view of, of pharmacy. I started off as a second year pharmacy student thinking that I would do a PharmD 
and work in clinical practice in a hospital. And where I ended up is in a very, very different place, but all under the umbrella of pharmacy. Uh, I graduated and I did a postgraduate degree uh, in finance. And from there, I co-founded a company called Cubic Health uh, in late 2003. And that journey saw us go from walking into a space in group insurance and health benefits that we knew very little about into working with a large self-insured plans across the country. So most of our clients today would be single employer, multi-employer plans and trusts that range in size between about 5,000 to 500,000 employee lives, uh, plus spouses and dependents. And our work um, is, is almost uniquely with that group. So a very different place, Zubin, from where my career started, but all mm-hmm. under the umbrella of pharmacy. And we're looking forward to hearing more about your decisions, the, the way you arrived at where you're at, and to understand a little bit more about uh, the psychology of entrepreneurship from the perspective of somebody who maybe had a very career, a very clear career path as a PharmD trained pharmacist, but decided to go in a different direction instead. Thanks, Mike. Let me turn it over next to Sarai and Livia. I'll get each of you perhaps to tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up here. Sarai, let's start with you. Uh, hi everyone. My, uh, my journey was quite different in a sense that um, I guess if you asked me 10 years ago that I would be here or tell me so, I would not believe in you because <laughs> I did not consider at the beginning entrepreneurship as something that I would go to. I have a background in engineering, so I did my uh, bachelor's in engineering science at U of D. Then um, I had a one-year co-op experience at Sanofi Cluster at that time. I thought I would go back to, to that company again and work in the industry. Um, I ended up doing a grad school at U of D again under pharmaceutical sciences. Um, I had TA'd a bunch of some of your courses already. <laughs> um, so in the past, I also had one other startup experience. I had taken an entrepreneurship course just because it sounded interesting in the last year of my undergrad. And then through that, I got involved with the incubators that are in U of D. And that was my first experience. Um, And later after I did my grad school, um, again, I was not thinking about doing a startup, Um, but what happened is that we, Livia and I started working on a project that was so exciting and interesting that, I saw a need where our solution would bring a value and that was diagnostic testing, decentralized access to diagnostic testing. We started with Zika. Uh, We had- That's Zika virus. Yes, Zika Zika virus. virus. Um, We had the unique opportunity to travel to Latin America, see our potential end users, see how much value it would bring, how they interacted. And for me, the, the one pivotal point was when the other PI was asking, what else can our product do? And that was the time where I kind of proposed <laughs> to Livia saying that I am thinking about doing this startup, but I would not do this if you do not say yes. <laughs> sure. And I said yes. <laughs> and she said yes. Well, and aren't we glad you both did and you're both here to tell us about it? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it was a crazy moment at that time, like two girls in Brazil uh, battling with a, a project, grad student projects, and we all know those grad student projects do not go as ex- anticipated, and we just wanted to dive in even a little further more, and here we are, so I'm going to let Livia explain her background. That's great, thanks Sarai. Livia? Yeah, um, I finished my high school in China, and then come to U of T to continue my university. My undergrad is pharmaceutical chemistry in pharmacy building, but it's research uh, oriented. Then I, in my last year, um, happily joined Keith Party's lab as an undergraduate uh, researcher. We, I started the first, first prototype of the product and I'm like so fell in love with this. And also I met Sarai during my last year. It's just like clicked and we continue this project as graduate students um, until from zero, from the concept to finishing a product to the field trial. Yeah. So listening to, yeah. listening to the two of you speak, it's just so clear to me how excited you are about your work, your, how excited you are about yeah. the possibilities. And you know, clearly that's something that's a really important part of entrepreneurship, your sort of emotional connection to the work. Thank you so much. And we're gonna be exploring a lot more of this in depth uh, shortly. Let me turn it over to our next panelist, Michael Doe. Michael, tell us a little bit about your experience and why you're on the panel today. 
Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Zubin. Um, so my name is Michael. I'm actually a, a practicing community pharmacist. Um, I'm actually going to work this Sunday. It's a long weekend shift and uh, not always easy right now in the market to, to get people in. So um, and I'm sure some of our and, listeners are thanking you for taking over a holiday weekend shift from them. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, so so my journey is, um, uh, you know, very just like just like uh, um, some of the panelists here, uh, I never thought I'd be here, you know, five years ago. And, um, but I've been, you know, a community manager um, for over five years at a, an independent pharmacy in Toronto. And there's a lot of learning, a lot of skill building. This is, you know, technology and just, just information in general is, you know, something that I just can't stop consuming. And just there's this, there's this love of, of problem solving and, and information and, also this um, um, innate um, personality where you, you just don't like taking uh, instructions from others and you <laughs> want to do your own thing. Um, that's always persisted, but it was a very gradual step-by-step -step process to, to getting to, to yeah. starting your own, your own uh, endeavor. And again, that, that excitement uh, and that self-motivation, I guess, is something that shines through in your comments. Um, thanks, Michael. Our last panelist tonight is John. So John, uh, explain to us a little bit about what you're doing here today. Thanks, thanks Zubin, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so I have a different background than a lot of the people that are on the panel, although the one thing everyone has in common is that we're not where we anticipated we would be. Uh, I studied uh, business undergrad at, at Wilfrid Laurier University in Kitchener-Waterloo, did an MBA, and then spent about a decade at the other end of the innovation spectrum working for the Chartered Accountants of Ontario, now the CPAs, but in a role that worked closely with students and as a liaison between high potential students and the professional services firms. And then left, uh, because I love that intersection of students and the corporate world and the not-for-profit world, and I joined an accelerator uh, non-for-profit called Next Canada that runs a series of programs for high potential student entrepreneurs from across the country, uh, was able to launch an artificial intelligence accelerator in both Toronto and Montreal, was the first full-time hire there, and uh, spent about a decade there. And then when I had, I had the opportunity to move to one of the top universities on the planet, that's not only great when it comes to research, but actually commercializing, translating, turning that research into, into companies, uh, I, I took the leap. And I guess the other little side hustle that I'll flag to the attendees tonight, my other entrepreneurial endeavor is that I, I run a little wine import business on the side. That's my side hustle. Oh, I think you and Mike Sullivan will have a lot in common then uh, there. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for getting us started. I think many people in the audience who aren't thinking of themselves as entrepreneurs, and I include myself in this uh, category, are always fascinated by the psychology behind on what an entrepreneur is and what an entrepreneur does. And I'd like each of you to think about and maybe share with us one key moment that you felt really defined your career path. Um, one sort of key incident or event that really directed you um, towards a more entrepreneurial rather than a safe, secure, stable, traditional kind of role. Let's start with Livia. Um, and if, is there any moment that you can reflect on that really helped to shape where you are today? Yes, so other than the proposal moment Sarah mentioned, where we see the impact of our product can do in Latin America, the moment I decided to continue the project in grad school is when I uh, have hands-on, have the work done in my undergrads to have this working product in hand, and then people are like commenting and loving it. These two moments switched my mindset from, okay, I'm gonna follow the protocol, doing lab work from, okay, I'm going to hands on create something to the moment I want to make a big impact with what I already learned and gained. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Sarai, what about you? What was your magic moment? Yeah, I think my magic moment was regarding my capstone project in undergrad that we ended up turning into another startup that I had mentioned called Expand Medical. Um, at that time, it was... So we were working on a project. In general, the projects that you work on is during that school period and when it's over, things are over. But seeing that you could make an impact, change somebody else's life, gave me such a great satisfaction. 
that I realized that being an entrepreneur is a path that I wanted to pursue. So I want to be the part of the good change rather than um, sitting and doing nothing. So that kind of resonated as we went along as well. Yeah. So for an educator like me, this is great information, actually, because it means that people like me need to really provide students like you uh, opportunities to do things like this so that you can actually see where you might go. Wonderful. Michael, what was your magic moment? I think, uh, I guess one of my, the one magic moment that I've had is, um, is actually in, in high school, I, I learned how to, how to code JavaScript in, in one of our courses. We had a computer science course in high school. And honestly, if that wasn't offered, I, I don't know if I'd be here today. And, and that's just the beginning of, of getting introduced to, to programming. And I think uh, it's, you never know until you try it if, if you have a knack for it. And so I love to, you know, when students do rotation with us at Metasys, I always get them to do some programming so they get some experience and, and it's never too late to start. It's always um, something that I think everyone should get some exposure to. What do you think it was about learning Java or learning coding? What was it that actually provided the seed for you to realize entrepreneurship could be in your future? There's this aha moment that uh, I try to get students to see where they can type something in and then into, into their editor, code editor, and then it would pop up on my screen or okay. it would go live. So, so, yeah. so one of the most basic kind of things that we do is we have this updates page on our platform where we write, you know, what are new features that are coming or what new features are released. And I always get students to write those so they can actually, something that they're typing in uh, is now seen all across Canada on all these different sites. And that's kind of like an aha moment that, that students get to see. So similar to Sarai and Livia, that just that notion of, wow, I did this. I can do this. So it's actually sort of early success because all of you were quite young, actually, when you had your aha moment. Um, that early success really opened your eyes to a potential future that you might not have thought of before. Mike, other than having the name Mike, because apparently all entrepreneurs need to have the name Mike, um, what, what, what was your aha moment? There's a couple that, that are related. The first one is, I remember my first day of business school thinking, what have I done? Like, what have I got myself into here? And I remember my very first class, I happened to start in January, which is an important part of the story. And I was doing three consecutive semesters full time and then finishing the following year. And I thought, I think I've got in over my head. And as it turns out, I mean, the academic difficulty of an MBA program is one one hundredth of what it is of a pharmacy program is. It's pretty much that simple. Um, and I'm not trying to demean uh, my, 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 my graduate studies, but you know, it's amazing to me that pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists, we just underestimate ourselves from the get-go. And we just think, well, you know, we know this little domain and, and you know, we're, we're really good here, but we can't go elsewhere. And it was so disappointing to think that I almost sort of sold myself out thinking that I, you know, I, had, I was in something I couldn't get into. But then the second aha moment was that was the first day of the first class of the first semester. By the end of that first three semesters, the end of the calendar year, I had actually negotiated to do some consulting work for my former employer for whom I worked full time the previous year. And when I got to the end of the year, something interesting happened. I made more money on my T4 going to school full time as an MBA student than I did working as a full time employee the previous year. Hmm. And so while I had said to myself, I'm going to learn finance, I'm going to learn business, I'm going to read this, I'm going to read that, I could never get it done in the confines of my job and some of the travel that my job entailed the previous year. And then it wasn't until I got into school, was working and, and on, on the side and going to school full time. And I realized, wait a second, in the process of expanding my mind, getting into something different, taking a few risks, I actually ended up economically further ahead than I would have if I had been at my desk. So that was when I kind of figured, well, there's probably no going back at this point in time. Well, and, and thank you for sharing that story, because, you know, of course, there's a lot of kind of like psychological issues and a lot of, uh, you know, noble talk about entrepreneurship. But we also need to be practical and say that a, an important driver of entrepreneurship are the economic opportunities um, that, that it potentially opens for people. So thank you for sharing your story, uh, Mike. I'd like to actually move on in your career trajectories um, and uh, reflect a little bit on what happened after you had your aha moment. And in particular, 
what do you say are one or two of the most important things that helped you to move from aha, and this is a possibility, to actually entrepreneurial entrepreneurship being a reality for you? It could have been things like material resources, family, friends, whatever. I'm curious, like sort of what allowed you to, to translate that aha moment into an actual career path? Let's start with Michael. Well, um, I think the U of T uh, ecosystem, startup ecosystem has helped us so much. Um, so we're part of H2I and they have, uh, it, we basically it's the healthcare uh, incubator uh, here and they have four different stages and you can come in with just an idea and they will work with you and they have advisors um, and, and, and really guide you through kind of the process because they've seen so many companies, they've seen so much um, um, of success and also failures and what to what to make sure, you know how to how to you know overcome those uh, those barriers and uh, also part of H2I is we they, they do sessions where um, you go into a room and you're you're there with all these other founders and you're learning from each other too so that that kind of ecosystem aspect is is just building relationships with other other uh, founders and other companies and, and learning as a group. Good, thank you, Michael. Maybe it's a convenient time for me to ask John to uh, maybe expand a little bit on this concept. Some people may not be familiar with the notion of the, the, the U of T ecosystem around all this. Could you sort of help our listeners and viewers uh, understand a little bit about what Michael was referring to there? Sure, and I'm, I'm ha so happy to hear H2I uh, highlighted because I feel like a few of the companies uh, that we're hearing from tonight have gone through H2I, which is the accelerator in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Um, but my office, UT Entrepreneurship, is the connective tissue or the glue for all of this incredible innovation and entrepreneurship that happens across our three campuses. Uh, UT actually has 10 different, we call them campus accelerators or campus-linked accelerators. In addition to H2I, uh, many people will be familiar with the Creative Destruction Lab, which is inside Rotman, the business mm -hmm. school. Uh, there's one called UTEST, the University of Toronto Early Stage Technology Accelerator, which is for IP or research that has grown out of the university, and they support about 20 companies each year. Uh, and then there's another six or seven scattered across the campuses and different faculties, different divisions. We're quite lucky and, and proud to say that there's really no wrong door. Uh, a lot of our more successful companies have participated in multiple accelerators uh, or other initiatives across the ecosystem. We have 300 plus courses that connect to entrepreneurship in some way at the University of Toronto. And there's a listing of all of those on our on the U of T entrepreneurship website as well. There's okay. co-working space, uh, the on-ramp co-working space in the Banting building across from Mars, and just a very rich ecosystem of supports, mentorship, funding for companies from idea stage to seed or even what we would call a series A. So as you grow, when Michael talks about, you know, level one through level four, H2I actually supports you from the time you and a few friends come up with an idea based on something you're working on all the way through to where you need key investor or partner introductions. Okay. So for some people listening, me included, words like accelerator and ecosystem, it sounds a little bit scary. Uh, to me. Um, acronyms like H2I, like all, all this stuff sounds a little bit intimidating. Um, what if you're, what if you are not as young and keen as Sarai and Livia and Michael? What if you're a mid-career professional? What if you're not a U of T graduate? What if you're like, are these things available to any, anybody who happens to walk in? Do you have to be a student number uh, and have a student card in order to access it? How, what's the process? No, it's a great question. Almost everything that we'll that we'll talk about or that you'll see on the on our website is open to alumni as well as students as well as faculty as well as staff. Uh, and so, uh, for example. H2I will work with anybody who's working on a health matters company, regardless of even if they're from the University of Toronto. So really great example of a, a rising tide raising all of the boats. Um, okay, so, so any connection. So if I was a student 35 years ago um, at U of T, as long as I've got some kind of connection, these are the sorts of resources that might be available to help support. 
And do, do I just knock on your door? Do I send you an email? What happens? <laughs> the best thing to do, and I know it sounds like a bit of a cop out, but the best thing to do is to go to the University of Toronto Entrepreneurship website. We know it's a very complex and, and a difficult uh, ecosystem or environment to maneuver. And so the website is designed um, to be able to direct an alumni or a student or anyone who's external towards the information that they need, uh, mm -hmm. whether they're looking for our startup directory or to take intellectual property education, or they just want to read some news or attend events. That's the other thing. A lot of our events, both virtual and in person, are open to alumni as well. Uh, and then obviously our newsletter and all of the social media is the great that is a great way to stay uh, up to speed. But I'm also happy. I love supporting alumni and I feel like that's part of the, the role of the University of Toronto Entrepreneurship Office. Okay. And so uh, at my peril, if anybody <laughs> who's listening wants to figure out how to plug in, uh, I'm happy to share my email through the organizers and, and triage or point you to the, the right part of the university. Okay. Um, now, of course, pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists are a skeptical and uh, very careful group generally. This sounds expensive. This sounds time consuming. Like, you know, how, how do I pay for these sorts of services? How much do I have to commit to engage with your group in these sorts of things? To engage with U of T entrepreneurship, it, it's free. I mean, the, the FREE -E free? FREE -E free. A, a, a caveat we, some of the things that we offer around co working space, there are some nominal cost recovery fees. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the most part, I, I do think, and you'll hear from the founders on the call, the biggest investment, the most expensive investment is, is the time and the commitment to, to build this. Okay. Um, yeah. And we're going to be posting some information that John has provided for uh, listeners and viewers today um, so that you can actually see how to access these websites, get a sense of how to navigate um, these websites to sort of see what might be appropriate for you. Let me turn it back then to our panelists. I'm going to ask Sarai and Livia to uh, maybe answer the question of what happened after your aha moment? What was the thing that allowed you to go from aha to action? Uh, I can jump in onto this one. So incubators was definitely the first gate. Uh, we went through U test, U test, H2I. I had been part of Hatchery in the past. And now we expanded a little bit in Ontario. We went to Velocity. They had been great in providing us space as well. Then we went international. We went to Y Combinator. Um, so all of how did you how did you hear about these incubators? Like, is there like like did you attend a, a a webinar like this at some point? But how did you even know these things existed? So it's pretty much uh, when you show up to the places and ask the right questions, people end up finding you. So my first entry was hatchery through the Joseph Orozco's course that I was taking. So it's, it was like a direct plugin. Mm -hmm. And then after that, through that, I heard about H2I because we were health related. And then U-Test was when, when we were doing our grad studies, it was more focused towards the University of Toronto IP-based startups. So all of them has kind of like a portfolio that they are gearing towards. And if you fit in, just go for it. Like learning more would not help. Yep. But this answer has been quite common. <laughs> one thing I want to highlight is actually one of the best um, support I got was finding the right people through incubators. So mm -hmm. Paul Chipperton and Dave Crouch, shout out to those two. They had been on my back pocket. Each time I was like, oh my God, I have never been a CEO. I have no clue what I'm doing. I need someone on the phone right now to ask questions. Those two guys were the people who have done it before. We met Paul actually in the first pitching event that I was giving about LSK, where everything was all over the place. It was just bare bones. And he was like, oh, I have this related background. Let's keep in touch. I would love to help. He introduces in his network. They were similar in terms of getting the manufacturing done. So it's really important to find right people and it's okay if you don't have them. I, in my, around me, I didn't have people who had entrepreneurship experience. My parents were doctors in the government. Everything was like cookie cutter based, those jobs that would come mm -hmm. up in the elementary school level. Um, so those were the people that I leaned on to get information. Very interesting. It, it reminds me of the line from uh, the Harry Potter series help at Hogwarts will be provided to those who ask for it. And so certainly we have an abundant ecosystem or, you know, places at the university to help people um, who, who, are, who are interested in reach out for that help. 
Mike, let me bunt it over to you. You're in a slightly different position than our previous panelists, but you also had to go through a process of going from, uh, hmm, this might be possible to making it possible. What, what, what was the thing that you think really helped to sort of springboard you forward? I have to tell you how incredibly jealous I am listening to all these stories because we started Cubic when I was 26 in early 2004. And there was no incubators. There was nothing like this. There was, there was this networking was very different. You know, we, I was a young pharmacist with some co-founders. There's two things that, that stood out. Number one, and it's great seeing Sarai and Livia here together. Having co-founders was incredibly important. I would tell anybody who asked, if it was just me in the pilot seat, I would have sunk the company a dozen times on my own. And I think my partners could have said the same thing. <laughs> So having, having that, but the second thing was, and maybe to be, put a different spin on it, it's amazing to see the kind of stuff that, that, that you're speaking about, that John's spoken about, that Sarai and Livia and Michael have spoken about, that really can catapult you. We did it the old fashioned way, which was just a lot of hard work. And, and that's where pharmacy was a huge asset because, you know, we would work 90 to hundred hour weeks and we would go work weekends and I would do 32 hour shifts in the pharmacy on a Saturday and Sunday, I would drive up on a Friday night and I would work from eight in the morning till midnight on a Saturday and Sunday and drive back at midnight on a Sunday into the city and start working at Cubic Monday morning, first thing, and use that money to pay the bills and, and, and finance Cubic. And then we would do our building and all of our stuff from there. So at the end of the day, it was nothing more miraculous than hard work and leaning on each other because there wasn't the kind of network here. In fact, I go back so far that this is a true story. One of my entrepreneurship professors from business school had connected us with the producers of Dragon's Den. And we got a call to be on Dragon's Den in the very first season that it was aired. Thank God we didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> because I, that would have been a disaster. Uh, but, you know, but that just kind of goes to show back then that was about as close as we came to an incubator. Um, and so it's just so amazing to hear you know, John and Michael and Sarai and Livia's perspective, because starting a business today is so much easier than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And back when we were doing it, it wasn't really a big thing. It was sort of a little bit odd. And I think that if I'm listening to this and I'm trying to take something away, is that doing it today is so much easier. But secondly, putting your head down and working hard, there is absolutely no substitute for that. Yeah. One of the things that I reflect on from uh, Sarai and Livia and you, Mike, is the number of times you use the word we um, and that, that the central role of a partner, um, somebody that you can lean on, somebody that you can pass a baton to when you need to. And that notion that um, entrepreneurship is sometimes a team sport that really requires that sort of uh, ability to work really, really well with another person and lean on. That's, that's a really important insight. And thank you for sharing that. It leads to the next question, and I'm going to open question to everybody on the panel. But I'm curious, as we think a little bit more about the psychology of what it takes to be an entrepreneur, what do you think is the special sauce, the key ingredient or characteristic that you think, based on your experience, um, somebody needs in order to pursue a career as an entrepreneur? I'm going to start with you, Mike. You've given us one idea already, and that is simply work hard. What else? What other key ingredient or characteristic do you think is important for a career as an entrepreneur? You have to have thick skin and you have to embrace failure as part of the path to success. If you want everyone to love you, you can't even stand on the sidewalk and hand out free ice cream anymore. Because if you <laughs> do that, someone's going to say, hold on a second, I'm lactose intolerant. Do you have a lactose intolerant version? Or, or hold on a second, I don't like this flavor. I want something else. If you want to be loved by everybody, you basically have to just do everybody's bidding all the time and, and be comfortable with that. You have to be comfortable realizing that if you go down a different path, there will be people that they, you know, they may not like what you're doing. They may not support what you're doing. They may not support you. You can't take any of that stuff personally. You know, it's, it's business and business is business and you kind of have to go from there. If someone's not buying from you, it's not a personal reflection necessarily. It may be for lots and lots of different reasons. If you're not making progress, again, it's nothing personal. It's related to the business. But if you fear failure, this is not the place for you. 
But if you, if you embrace it and realize at the end of the day that failure is actually a really, really meaningful step to something really successful, and you look at it that way and truly believe it and learn from your mistakes. Uh, I mean, Zubin, you and I have known each other for a long time. And if I could go back to, you know, the Mike Sullivan that you would have first met years ago, there's certainly a few things I would have done differently. But at the end of the day, that's all part of the game. It's all part yeah. of the package. So I would just sum it up by saying there has to be a certain amount of resilience. You can't mm-hmm. be too thin. If that, that, that would be my take. Thank you. Michael, what about you? What uh, is for you one of the key ingredients or characteristics to be a successful entrepreneur? I think um, success, sometimes when you think about entrepreneurs, they, they think of, oh, if it's a, you have a great idea or something like that, you come up with a great idea. But really, it's, it's about execution. Um, you have to come up with great ideas every week if you want to be successful. You have to execute every day, every week. Um, and you can learn to do that. You can learn to do that. You, you practice and you learn, you improve your problem solving skills. You, you, you know, it, it's, it's things that you can develop before you, you, you take that dive into being an entrepreneur. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, you, you work on yourself continue, continuously and, and don't, it's a roller coaster. There's ups and downs, but just work on yourself continuously and just work to uh, step by step, just work on executing on a daily and weekly basis. Right. Um, Sarai and Livia, do either of you have anything to add to uh, Mike and Michael's comments? I would um, resonate with Mike more in terms of the self-driven part. So you have to be passionate about a lot of things to drive you forward. Um, Of course, putting work down is one thing and having it starter is also a very important part. Yeah. yeah. In addition to that, what I would say is being okay with unknowns and saying, I don't know. Um, this will be a path that no one have carved before, and it would be your job to carve it. So uh, when you don't know, you can't give up at that point. You just say, I don't know. I need to find people or come help find people who will help me get there or come up with a plan so that I get there. And being able to openly talk about it is really a huge bonus. Excellent. Thank you. Mike Sullivan. You know, there's one thing I think I would, a really important message I would want to share. That one, I get really uncomfortable when people equate entrepreneurship to being an extrovert. And I think it's incredibly important that people realize that your level of, of extroversion has nothing to do with your success as an entrepreneur. And I think, look at all of us on the screen. I'm sure we all have extremely different backgrounds, extremely different personalities, extremely different interests and passions and strengths and weaknesses. And I think the one thing that holds some people back is they feel like, well, you know, I'm not as outspoken or I'm not comfortable networking or I'm not a salesperson or I don't perceive myself as being kind of one of these inspirational people that gets on a soapbox and says something to a team and energizes them and that sort of stuff. I really think at the end of the day, that's an antiquated notion of what leadership is. Uh, I would say that this is, it's so nice to have, to share the panel with this whole group to realize that it's, it's everything we just finished talking about Mm -hmm. and nothing to do with someone's level of extroversion. That's such a valuable insight. Thank you, Mike. John, I'd like you to reflect on what the, what the panelists said and add your two cents here. Yeah, I'm glad Mike mentioned the, the piece around extroversion and building onto uh, risk and failure, because I think there's this perception out there that entrepreneurs will wildly run into, you know, the, the, the burning building. They're <laughs> not looking at risk. They are just I- embracing that failure is inevitable. And I think when you look at the people that are on the panel and some of the top entrepreneurs, the steps they take are to reduce the risk. They might not have all of the information, but you gather the info, the intel, the resources you need to lower the risk. And I think that's one of the other traits um, that makes for a successful entrepreneur. And then also to the resilience piece, yes, you're going to be told no 99 times before you get that one yes, and you've got to embrace that. But if you've done, we would call it maybe customer discovery, you're talking to your customer to find out if there's a market for what you're building. And if you think that you have targeted or you're talking to the right 99 customers and they're all saying no, use that as an opportunity to find out why so that you can improve your product or service. Yeah, you, and you got a lot of emphatic nods from Sarai and Livia um, at that point. Thanks for sharing that. Now, maybe sort of building a little bit on uh, something that Mike uh, mentioned. 
um, you know, sometimes it can be a, a difficult and a bit of a lonely journey being an entrepreneur. I, Mike mentioned, I've known him for quite some time. And I remember when, when he and his partner first started talking about this idea for Cubic Health, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. It just seemed like such an odd thing. And well, why wouldn't you just go get a job in a pharmacy like a normal person, Mike, and live happily ever after? Sometimes it can be lonely. It can be isolating. People look at you with a little bit of skepticism. How do you actually build a kind of network you need to withstand some of the questions, some of the scrutiny, and maybe some of the negativity that in your personal life that surrounds this, this kind of a decision? Let me start with you, Mike. Oh, boy, that's a great question. Um, if I'm being really honest, one of the biggest disappointments looking back is there wasn't a lot of support. There wasn't a lot of people there saying, hey, this is really interesting. You know, this is great. Um, can I introduce you to anybody? Can I, you know, what's this, what's that? A lot of it was really, oh, this is really interesting. What are you doing? Until you became a going concern. And then when you became a going <laughs> concern, people stop asking you questions. And it's almost like people want to see an accident, right? They, they drive by, they want a rubberneck and see an accident. But then if you kind of pass that stage and this becomes your career and this becomes, you know, where you're taking things, then the questions really, really start to slow down. And it's disappointing, but it is what it is. And I, and I don't think of it a negative way. The way I've kind of looked at it, the way I built my network is every single person who's a co-founder of a business is somebody I'm interested in talking to. Like one of my, one of the, one of the best conversations I've had recently was a dinner with someone who owns an auction house. It would get completely different worlds, but we share so many of the same challenges, so many of the same, uh, you know, things that we enjoy and that we take out and we appreciate, but, you know, nothing to do with the same background whatsoever, but a real good understanding. When you know you've got other people who've been there, who are currently there, who are on their way in there and they can relate, it's so reassuring because you can kind of smile because I love, like so I said that, you know, people who, um, you know, who are working a more traditional job with a paycheck comes in every 14 days um, and it's there, you know, it's, it's hard to relate to some of the aspects of the life. And so I think the biggest success, and I learned it a little later than I would like to have learned it, was not looking for all of my network inside of pharmacy or related circles, but really trying to diversify and find a whole bunch of voices. And that's why I'm so, I'm so jealous of the infrastructure that, that John's referred to and that clearly Sarai and Livy and Michael have taken advantage of where that comes to you so much more you know, quickly. And there is that, that, that sort of network. But I really think those diverse perspectives and speaking to you know, people who run businesses internationally, not even in Canada, and just realizing, wow, they share a lot of the same kind of storylines it's just engaging and it's powerful. Yeah. And I think that Zubin, I wish I would have done more of that earlier. I think it would have countered some of my disappointment that there wasn't more sort of organic, you know, interest in seeing something. Yeah. Different. yeah. Finding your community basically. And it may not be like the pharmacy community necessarily. Well, they, interestingly enough though, yeah. they, it all comes full circle yeah. because you find that community, you go and expand and you realize at the end of the day that good ideas and a track record integrity, those things will always rise at the top. And then you can reconnect in with the pharmacy community. And some of my work now, a lot of my work now is back in pharmacy, pharmacy. circles. Yeah. And it's awesome. And I love it. And it's so, I don't have, there's no negativity whatsoever, quite the opposite. But to get there, I had to get out of that and get into a bit of a different perspective to bring it kind of full circle. So I, it, it, there's nothing negative. It's just, I really wish I had understood the need for diverse perspectives once upon a time. But if you told me 15 years ago, hey, listen, why don't you have dinner with this founder of an auction house? <laughs> so what are you talking about? Uh, what, what good is that? But oh boy, what a yeah. miss. Great. Uh, Sarai and Livia, I'd like to ask you the same question as well. And I'd ask you to also think a little bit about it as you're, you are both uh, educated young women. Um, are there some unique pressures you may have faced from family members? You know, Sarai, you mentioned your parents are, uh, you know, are government doctors, and why, why not just take a safe, stable, secure career path forward? 
Um, as sort of young women exploring entrepreneurial pathways, what were some of the things that you particularly needed to navigate in order to fulfill your ambitions? So this is a really funny story because um, when I first started, um, as I mentioned, I didn't think that was a career path. Um, my parents, I'm also international, were looking forward to after all that international tuition paid, <laughs> getting some <laughs> returns on that. <laughs> and, um, when I first mentioned that I wanted, I first hide it because I wanted to explore myself to figure out, is that what I want? Uh, it, it was kind of like bringing a boyfriend to your family. <laughs> um, and then the next step I realized, okay, this is what I want. I'm that set on this and no one can change this path, although I love my parents. Then I mentioned this to them and the reaction was like, kind of raised eyebrows. It's like, are you sure? What are you doing? Because they didn't know. They weren't educated on this part. Um, and then uh, when I started winning competition, because this was like our initial fundraising was find any free competition that you can enter and try to win that. And we raised quite a good amount of money through that. And when we got our first 100K check, it was like, okay, this is serious. Why are people giving That's you That's real money, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then it went like them seeing how excited I'm about. We were quite successful and we did work really hard to get where we were. And then it switched to, oh, how can I help you with? I don't understand, but I can connect you with someone I know here, someone I know there, to the point my dad was like, I want to be your distributor. <laughs> you know, like, this is a really big spin. Yeah. And I was the like, hold your horses, I'll let you know, and we have to have a business discussion then. Okay. Livia, what about you? Was, was there anything that you needed to navigate from a personal or family perspective? And how did you go about doing that? 100%. So my dad also have a very uh, short experience of starting his own business, which not as quite smooth as what I went through for the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. So he was like very negative in the beginning saying, okay, I don't think that's a good way for you to grow in the career path and also your um, experience wise. If there's multiple opportunities out there, why you choose this one, the like, hardest part. However, uh, it's a hands-down work. I ignore this noise, but <laughs> focusing on delivering the work. More and more parents seeing my growth, personal growth, and also my passion still continue. They've been very supportive. So along the way, they're very supportive. So okay, I'm very great. Grateful. Thank you. Michael, what about you? You couldn't be happy just getting a job as a pharmacist somewhere? Um, I actually, I, I do still like, I, I mean, I still, I still love being a pharmacist, um, but um, there's just, you know, um, there's just things that, um, we, you know, I want to solve and things that I think we can, I, I can do. And it's not just me. I, I think I, I just want to kind of like um, echo what everyone else is saying, you know, you need a co-founding team, you need a co-founder. Um, so for me, I have uh, Joella who, um, has a different background. She's not in pharmacy. She has more of a, a startup background. And, and actually um, where I'm taking kind of a step back from terms of the C, CEO role so I can focus on the product, focus on the clinical aspects of the, the platform and, and the system. And, and Joelle is actually gonna take on the CEO title. And, and you know, I'm so excited for her and it's, it's, it's her, it's the rest of the team. It's, you know, we've been helped by so many people that have just um, students that have gone rotation, people that have done internships with us. Um, there's just, you can't succeed on your own. You need um, so much help. And, and you know, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, so it's they, amazing yep. to tap into yes. that. And again, that notion of tapping into other people, if sort of, you know, your family, your friends, your immediate circle aren't necessarily as supportive as you would like them to be, finding people who are and helping them, having them help you to build the resilience you need to move forward is really, really important. I'm going to be finishing up, I think, the sort of formal series of questions before we move to the question and answer session. And that's a cue for the audience to think about any questions they would like to ask you. So feel free to enter those um, into the chat, and we will be happy to share the audience's questions with our panel in a few moments. The last question I'd like to ask is perhaps not the most optimistic, but perhaps it is question. And it's to go back to something all of you spoke about um, and that's a question of failure. We've heard from all of you this notion that entrepreneurship is not possible 
without the ability to fail, to learn from failure, and to bounce back from it. Can you tell us a little bit about what advice you would give to people listening in terms of how do you do that? Because pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists are generally not accustomed to failure. They're not accustomed to not succeeding. And it's not something that comes naturally to us. What advice would you have for the audience in terms of how to embrace and grow from failure? Let me maybe start with, uh, with Michael. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, it's it's very much a roller coaster, and you know, it's, I mean, with social media, you you know, people tend to only post their wins, <laughs> so um, it's very easy to look at, you know, entrepreneurship and and think that um, it's it's just it's just a rocket ship. Everyone's just um, just scaling and 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 growing and and getting lots of investment and everything like that. But it's it's really there's ups and downs, and I think. Um, you have to be aware of that. And I think something that I need to still work on is, is celebrating your wins because you do win too. And sometimes <laughs> as entrepreneurs, we're, I'm so hardworking and like, you know, Joella is also, we're just crazy hardworking and we don't celebrate our wins as much. And I think you have to take time to do that as well. Great advice. Uh, Sarai and Livia, what are your thoughts on failure and advice you would give to others to think about how you can actually embrace it, learn from it and grow with it? Um, I guess I can start. Um, in terms of failures, expect there, there's going to be a lot. There's nothing going to be perfect, but um, especially since this is the path that nobody has carved before. But learning from uh, failures and um, putting right, understanding boundaries, again, the places where you don't know and knowing right questions to ask is really important. And for us, one thing that I really considered as a failure was I wish we started earlier so that we could talk to more customers, do that market research that John talked about and um, get all the information as early as possible. And had we started at the beginning of our Zika virus journey during the COVID times, we would have been so much more successful because we would have known more information ahead. So we had to do a lot of crunch work, put more hours the less sleep in our lives. Mm -hmm. It could have been much smoother and we would have known much better in, in front of everything uh, and could have made our lives easier. So I would say, just go for it. Yep, okay. Livia, anything to add? Yeah, so I my point is very related to what Michael just said. As entrepreneur, you tend to work really hard. You always see what's next step, what's a potential risk you're gonna take. It's very easy to get burned out, which personally and Sarai, we always experience like a lot of burnout where you, your function level is like minimum. Mm -hmm. So prioritizing yourself over work and also give yourself a proper break, it's also a very important lesson for entrepreneurs to learn. Excellent, thank you. Mike Sullivan, your thoughts on failure. I think anyone who is too focused on failure is just profoundly narcissistic <laughs> because at the end of the day, how is failure in business? If you've tried the right way and you've had integrity, you've done the right thing. It's not, you haven't failed because you've done something uh, offside or uh, against the rules. How is it any different than if someone's uh, relationship breaks down? You know, if you're divorced or how is it any different than if someone's child or children don't grow up to be engineers and, and astronauts and physicians, etc. And what happens if they, 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 they don't get on their feet to nearly the same degree? Uh, you know, does someone consider themselves a failure if their child is battling an addiction? I do there's some sense of a failure if their marriage doesn't work. Uh, maybe, and maybe that prevents some people from facing and coming to it. But at the end of the day, who cares? No one's keeping score at the end, you know? And so I think it's the same thing with business. If anyone thinks that someone's sitting there with a score sheet saying, oh, well, I'm going to make note of this and it's going to be in anyone's consciousness, you know, even the next day. Um, I just think that's just a that's just a profound narcissism. And and I think this era and of social media and 24 hour news cycles 
should be a real inspiration for people to realize that nobody cares about your stuff because in 24 hours, everything will have turned over. And so Mm -hmm. I think if you're caring too much for what other people are thinking and you're fearing failure, there's probably something else at play here. And so it kind of is liberating because at the end of the day, you're probably, the more you fail up front, the more you learn from it, it's actually not a bad thing at all. It means you've taken the right risk. So I think I, I look at it more broadly. And, and I, I just, when you, when you see that kind of mentality, you, you, I don't know, I, it's, yeah. it's, it's sad on a lot of different levels. And I think it, you know, there's so much I take from being an entrepreneur being a parent as well, because at the end of the day, I'm not going to say no to my kids until I've heard what they're doing and what's the rationale, what you're doing and give me, you know, tell me a little bit more about this and, and, or if you can practice what you preach, it makes you a better person, makes you a better parent, makes you a better friend. You know, you just start to realize a lot of things that you can start to embody in your, in your business career and your, in your entrepreneur career that you can take another aspect of life, make you a better person. And so I think learning to, learning to fall on my face early on was probably humbling and made me a far, I can I probably would have zero friends if I hadn't hit failure. I probably would be so insufferable um, <laughs> that it actually, it gives you the kind of humility that just makes you a better person. So I, I just don't see a downside upside. You have success and things go well downside you have a little few bumps a little bit of you know turbulence on the way and you end up growing for it so there, is there really a downside when you kind of look at it that way that's that's kind of what i've done to put it into perspective well thank you and uh, a really interesting insight into an entrepreneurial mindset uh thanks for sharing i want to turn it over uh finally before we move over to audience questions um to john and John, thank you so much for joining us today, for reflecting and uh, on what the speakers have talked about and for sharing some of the support services the university provides for entrepreneurs. What I'd like you to do is maybe share with the audience from your perspective as somebody who has worked with young entrepreneurs um, in a variety of different contexts, what's the, the, the best advice you would give somebody considering an entrepreneurial pathways? What are some pitfalls to avoid, some strategies to embrace that you've learned from your work with entrepreneurs? I like this question. I get this question a lot. And so hopefully I've got three kind of pieces of advice and hopefully it will connect a lot of what we've talked about uh, so far during the panel. One is fall in love with uh, solving the problem uh, or the opportunity. Don't fall in love with your solution or your technology or your research. I think that's one of the most common pitfalls that entrepreneurs make. Number two has to do with founder dynamics and co-founders. And you've heard how critical the founder decision is and who you're working with. I have two two thoughts on this. Number one, I think there used to be this mindset maybe five or 10 years ago that your co-founders should be people that you want to have a drink with, have a beer with. And and there's probably still a little bit of that true when you're working 100 hours a week on the business. But I think we've evolved and now there's so much empirical data that shows that diverse teams by academic background, by gender, by ethnicity, cultural background, age, make for stronger, higher performing teams. And so one, consider um, the background of your founders. And number two, and this one uh, often kind of is a little uncomfortable to talk about, but it's one of the reasons why those accelerators are are helpful is pretty early on with your co-founders, you do wanna talk about um, shareholders or partnership agreements. We don't wanna think about things going, not going well, um, but you don't wanna get to a point a year or two into a business where you've just got kind of handshake agreements and goodwill when things are going sideways. So that's number two. And number three, and again, I think this is a HBO, Silicon Valley, the, the, the social media that we watch, there's this infatuation with chasing funding from venture capitalists, from angel investors. When you're starting out, the longer you can go without taking on any investment, especially investment that dilutes your company, it, the better. So you heard about LSK winning pitch competitions. A lot of the time, there are so many opportunities to apply for grant fund- funding to leverage programs like MyTax. The longer you can go without taking on that funding and giving up an equity stake in the business, the better. And it will also force you to have discipline and we call it bootstrapping or trying to make the most out of very limited resources. The longer you can do that, the better. Interesting. Thank you for sharing those perspectives. I'd like to invite the audience now to share your thoughts, your perspectives, your ideas, and your questions with our panel. 
um, this is a great opportunity to ask the kinds of questions you may have always thought about, but uh, never had people to ask. And please use the chat function to enter your questions. I'm happy to share some of those questions with our panelists. I see our first question has come through. I'm going to open this up to everybody on the panel. Uh, the question is, how do you navigate work-life balance with beginning a company or joining one in the early phases of development? All of you have spoken about hard work, 80-hour weekends working in pharmacies, nose to the grindstone, et cetera, et cetera. How do you actually make that work, particularly if you um, have other family responsibilities or simply like to sleep five or six hours a night? Maybe I can start with, uh, with Michael. Uh, how do you balance it? It's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy. And, and maybe, maybe like one, one um, alternative is, is not, not being a founder, and, but being a, an early employee. There's a lot less responsibility. You're able to still be innovative, solve problems. You're, you're, you're able to make a huge, huge impact. Yeah. I, I just want um, to pause you for a second. That's a really interesting insight. And I think you expand a little bit on that. That notion that entrepreneurship isn't necessarily about founding a company. You can actually help build companies. There are different roles for entrepreneurially minded individuals. Could you expand a little bit on what you just said in terms of don't found a company, help somebody else found a company? Well, I mean, we're, we're hiring at Medicis <laughs> right now. Um, we're looking for a pharmacist to join our team too. Um, but like um, for me, um, we, as a company, we, we really believe in you, you know, if you need, you can't just hire top talent necessarily. You have to kind of build it. You know, we're not, we're not, we're never going to be Google or, or Apple or Amazon where we can attract the best of the best. Uh, so we want to get people in my role um, moving forward is to train people that we hire to basically take over everything that I do and, and, you know, be, you know, um, be that leader in the company and be, be those leaders in the company. So, um, I think it's a great opportunity and you get to hundred percent be innovative and do everything mm -hmm. without necessarily all the pressures sure. of, of making all the decisions on your own. Interesting. Mike Sullivan, what are your thoughts on work-life balance? Oh boy. Um, first of all, I want to say that everything John said in his last comment, if you had to distill this thing down to two minutes, you would play that two minutes of John's commentary, which was unbelievably on point on so many different levels. So I just thought that was just incredible um, summation of some, some really key pieces to this question on work-life balance. The reason why I started Cubic with my co-founders when I was 26 was because I knew I was at that point in my career where I could put those kinds of hours in, but it came at a cost. I didn't get married and buy a house and do the various different things everybody else did along the way, um, you know, have kids, all that sort of stuff. That stuff all came later if it came at all. And you have to understand there are some trade-offs. There is no magic fairy running around saying, oh, well, listen, it's now time to tap you on the shoulder and take some time for yourself and do this and do that. Uh, so I think Michael's comment is, ex is an exceptional one. You don't necessarily have to be the person or, 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 or co-founder that has to take on all that responsibility. You can be involved in other ways, absolutely, and make a big impact and, and have a huge role. So I would say, Zubin, uh, it, it's, it's really, really tough. And I trade it off personally, knowing that um, being earlier, being earlier in my career, not having much of a network, it was going to take a lot longer to get to where we wanted to be. But the trade-off was I could put the time and effort in then and it wasn't, didn't come at an opportunity cost that was different. If, mm -hmm. I, if I were in my mid forties or, you know, my early fifties, um, I think it would have to be a very different arrangement and a very different co-founding group um, to, to make that same kind of decision, because I don't think that necessarily would be feasible. So uh, that, that's, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, I think that's why there is not one particular path and, and one way forward. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sarai, what about you? Work-life balance. Yeah, so speaking from experience, at the beginning, we did not have that. And we did not have that for a long time until we both burnt out. So you should have that to some extent. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean sometimes maybe you won't have every other 
weekdays, evening spent with your friends. You need to do some sort of compromises and figure out what works for you. And talking on another female level, um, when we were talking about starting a startup, one of the things that, that I talked to Livia was about, we're females, we're young females. At one point we will marry someone and would like to have kids. And doing that transition, we had to time it because I personally did not want to be pregnant or caring for a kid when I was trying to care for my other kid, which is the startup. <laughs> um, yes, you've already given birth to a company. Yeah. <laughs> So we had to do kind of sacrifices and planning around that. That definitely doesn't mean if you're pregnant, you can't do a startup. But this is something that I wanted to plan ahead and don't put myself into a hard situation. Uh, But I do know that there are a couple of people whose relationships had struggled. So if you're in a relationship, it's really important to set the expectations saying that I would be really busy, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. That means... I will make time for you, but we need to discuss this in advance. We need to plan two weeks of our dates in advance. So yeah. that kind of communication is really important. Yeah. So planning is, you know, being organized and planning is really important. I'm going to come to you with that question in a moment, Livia. But first, I see John um, has something he'd like to add. John, go ahead. Thanks, Zubin. Uh, this, this won't be for everyone, but just wanted to highlight a couple of options that might connect to this topic, because for alumni that are watching that have that, you know, current permanent salary, thinking about do I take the plunge and start a company, um, there are a couple of organizations, we talk about accelerators at University of Toronto, but there are a couple of groups in the city in Toronto, that are for people that want to dip their toe in maybe build something part time, get a little bit of what we would call traction or success before taking the plunge. And so um, those those groups off the top of my head, Founder Institute is one of them, and they have a Toronto chapter. Uh, the second one uh, is called Entrepreneurs First, and they're, they started out of the UK and then created a chapter in Toronto. And then the Mars Discovery District, which is across the street from our building on the St. George campus, does all kinds of introductory entrepreneurial networking, education, workshops, events, etc. And so those are three options for people trying to figure out uh, how to start with without going in full time right off the hop. Yep. And so another way of considering work-life balance is you don't necessarily have to commit everything um, in the way that many of our panelists did. There are sort of incremental steps that could be considered. Livia, let me come back to you and get your reflections on on your work-life balance in the Mm -hmm. uh, early days of your company. Yeah, I do have some comments. So Sarah mentioned about planning power, which is very important for long-term. But for short term, everyone's different. Someone can be feel recharged by simply by eating a good meal. And then that person would call this a good life balance already. So with your low, so lower expectation, find the right way to refresh yourself would be the key to keeping running this marathon. Very good advice. Thank you. We have our next question from our audience. And this actually comes from an educator. And the question is, or comment is, as an educator, I find it difficult to communicate the value of learning about entrepreneurship to current students in a pharmacy program. Um, And and since most of these students lack the experience and sense of reality that not every clinical service will be readily embraced, for example. Any advice on what educators ought to do to foster an interest and a passion about entrepreneurship with students either in the pharmaceutical sciences or in pharmacy. Let me start with Michael Doe. What should people like me and my colleagues be doing to uh, create the next Michael? Well, I mean, one aspect is um, we do rotations, uh, after rotations, I mean, so we hire students as well. Um, if, if there are students that want to kind of see behind the curtain, see what we do on a daily basis. Um, there's also um, a hackathon that's run, that's being run, I think next month. It's called HackRx 2022. It's like a pharmacy hackathon that some uh, U of T and U, UW students are running. So, um, you know, there are kind of aspects to kind of like, as a student, as you're learning to kind of dip your toes in and kind of experiment. But I don't think we want to push entrepreneurship on, 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 on people and, and we want to be yeah. honest with them. And it, it, there's a lot of ups and downs. So, so it's, 
Yeah, so it's interesting. So, like the, the idea of pushing entrepreneurship may not be a good idea, but opportunities like, for example, an appy rotation with an entrepreneur, maybe that's something that educators can really sort of focus a bit on. For those in the pharmaceutical sciences, sorry, Livia, what what would you say would be things that 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 your professors, your PIs, principal investigators, they could be doing to perhaps uh, encourage more entrepreneurship? Um, it's definitely um, Keith does that a lot too. Like, and that's Keith Pardee, who was yeah, your uh, supervisor as a graduate <laughs> student. Yes, exactly. Um, is that opening up the thinking way that is not just staying in academia or sometimes considered the cursed route of industry. <laughs> <laughs> There's other option of being entrepreneurship. Um, and I think seeing people like us who had been there a not have not considered that in the past, but ended up getting here, how that happened, seeing, hearing, seeing those stories. I do get a lot of stories that like after people hearing our exodus as well, <laughs> us getting acquired, they're like, okay, what did you do? How did you start it? So you did it. That sounds like something doable. Can I do that? And I'm yeah. like, of course, and I will do my best to help you and guide you and tell you all the mistakes I did. <laughs> That's so, interesting. So maybe it's not something like educators might not be the right people to convey. Maybe it needs to be peers. It needs to be people that they recognize. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Livia, what are your thoughts about what, if not educators, educational institutions might be able to do to support uh, greater thinking about entrepreneurship? So thinking back my undergrads, I want to give a big shout out to Dr. Dubins, who opened a very unique course for pharmaceutical chemistry students to learn programming Arduino thing, which is bringing me back to, bring me to the um, project I end up being uh, loving. So giving, encourage them to do more than just what you focused on on your specialist would be one way. And then, of course, with the support of the department, uh, Dr. Vince ended up hosting a lot of sessions and encouraged a lot of other of my uh, classmates to to try a different career path. Mm. Not just maybe not all entrepreneurs, but all other funds. Uh, occupation. So, yeah. so maybe uh, some entrepreneurship in education is a way of encouraging entrepreneurship. Different kinds of courses exposing students to like, you know, not being so rigid in the way we think about curriculum and courses. Exactly. Mike, you, you, you have been an educator. You are an educator and have taught many, many pharmacy students over the years. What's your answer to the question of what educators can do to inculcate a sense of entrepreneurship in, uh, in students? I think the biggest mistake I made was thinking that everybody would find it as important as I did. And then that kind of just becomes preachy and and it loses effect very, very quickly. I think if I could go back and look back, I would say that the most important thing from an education standpoint would be showing different examples of what this means or what a specific subject means and making them representative of the people in the audience. You know, people who can look and see and feel themselves in some of these different stories and some of these different permutations of what you're talking about. And again, it's not just someone in the pilot or co-pilot seat, but somebody in another seat, somebody who looks like me, somebody who looks like this person, somebody looks the person beside me, different stories about, you know, people falling on their face and getting up and doing different things. I think it's just sharing those stories and having it be very authentic and not come off as sort of preachy and thou shalt sort of understand the importance. I mean, the number one skill I would tell anybody who asked me is to learn how to sell. The number one skill in any, in any profession for anybody is learning how to sell. I mean, you're selling yourself when you're in a relationship with someone. I mean, you, you know, but you can't, you can't tell people, hey, you have to learn to be a salesperson because that comes off with a very, yeah. very negative connotation for a lot of people. It's, it's perceived as being kind of, you know, below most people's professional standards. But if you frame it as, you know, learning the art of persuasion, learning the art of, you know, understanding how to interact with people and, and, and learning some of, you know, the neuroscience behind that, for an example, framing it in different ways that people say, oh, that's interesting. I never thought of it like that. Uh, I think is so important. And I think it's just a certain level of patience that not everyone's going to get there. But if if we do it the right way with the right stories and the right variety, I think the success metric is someone reflects on it three years later. It says, you know what, at the time, I didn't think much of this, but I remember this. 
yeah. and it has more impact now. I think that's going back, Zubin, if, if, if I could change how I would have framed it, it would have been like that. Interesting. Thank you. Um, John's also been very generous in sharing uh, much of his expertise and the v abundant resources that are available. Um, sort of at an institutional level, John, the University of Toronto is committing to uh, sort of an entrepreneurial culture by hosting these sorts of uh, incubators and other sorts of uh, supports and facilities. Any advice you would give to our audience in terms of uh, taking the first step? in terms of actually, you know, saying like going from idea to action and sort of approaching some of these incubators. How would you advise people to take that first step? I mean, the first thing to do is just, is to put yourself out there, right? They, all of these accelerators have inbound uh, forms. They host events that are open to the, the community. And so it's about finding the one that's right for you and sending that first email, leveraging my offer, going to an event. Um, a lot, a few of us were at Collision last week, which is the largest technology conference in North America, 40,000 people at the Undercare Center in person. Um, but the university and the ecosystem provided a whole bunch of tickets to students, alumni, staff. And, and that was one of those events that is a little bit overwhelming and sensory overload. But you can go there and, and dip your toe in or dive in and, and a whole bunch of serendipitous introductions, collisions, things will, will happen there. And so again, it's a cliche, but just kind of put yourself out there. Um, and then building off of the last uh, question around from the educator just you know I, I do think having the mindset that you're going to develop entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial skills that will help you regardless of whether you start a company or not is is important to highlight in addition to those real world examples and case studies and the university is also um, through initiatives uh, like programs called prime which focuses on precision precision medicine and medicine by design and h2i um, have come together with creating multidisciplinary teams and actually have a building a, a health tech biotech company program now that I also believe is open to, to alumni. And so those are a few of the ways to, to get started. But uh, again, leverage my office because we're there to help uh, alumni, to help anyone that got excited by what they're hearing tonight, navigate through what can be an overwhelming uh, network at first. Excellent. And if anybody does get excited about what they're hearing tonight, please let us know, actually, um, because we'd love to hear what the impact of this event might have been on your thinking. We have a question from Darren in the audience. And the question, interesting question, how do you balance taking feedback that you receive as an entrepreneur with trusting your gut when it comes to making a major decision? Very interesting question about the entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, I saw Sarai and Livia uh, smiling first. So I'm going to ask you uh, first to ask Livia, would you like to take a stab at that question first? This is a very important lesson for entrepreneurs to learn by trusting yourself when you have all the information that you think you need to collect, to make a decision. People always very easy to judge what you say, especially you're young, unexperienced, but from our experience, we trust our gut, trust our res reasoning, mm -hmm. where you sometimes have the confidence to move forward with your own decision. Okay, yeah. that's right. To add to that, I had a lot of people, so when you're asking feedback, like for example, I had a topic where I had to make a decision, I would shop around, I would take this to Paul, I would take this to David, I would leverage H2I, Paul Santer, Andres, and ask a sample size of five everyone will say something else <laughs> and then i would create my own answer where when somebody questioned me i could say i did not do this because of this and this and at the end of the day it's your business nobody is in your shoes therefore they can only judge from the outside and i had a lot of issues with self-trust that's something i had to build over time to trust myself so that i could say no confidently and stick with my decision and that was making decisions as soon as possible without rushing of course is one of the most important lessons i learned interesting thank you mike sullivan how do you balance taking feedback that you receive with uh trusting your own gut Ooh, i would say um a couple of things number one the most important feedback to me is the feedback of customers 
So I, I want to understand where the feedback is coming from. It was coming from a customer. I'm interested. I also want to be asking them questions, not waiting for feedback, but asking them questions and getting a sense. That's the number one thing. That's the center of everything because that, that enables you to improve on everything you're doing. And the second thing is making sure that the whole management team understands everything that's going on and has a say and has a voice and feels like they have a voice to say, hmm, yeah, that's interesting. Let's reflect on this together. And there's a very good chance that we'll all end up, you know, going down the right path um, if we've considered it. And so, so the, the most important innovations in our company have not come from me. Uh, you know, they've come from the team. And so I, I think it really is about just understanding uh Who's, who's providing that feedback is the number one thing. And then second of all, before making any decision about it is having that open discussion. And I think if you've been open with your team, it doesn't even mean the founders, but the broader team, they'll always be willing to, to be devil's advocate and bounce that stuff off. And then it, it makes decision making a lot easier. Interesting. Uh, Michael, how have you balanced this important uh, issue in your, in your career and in your, uh, in your development? Well, one thing you can do is is really try to uh, write down what your, your company culture is, write down what your principles are, make that visible uh, with all your employees and, and, and really build kind of a set of what really defines um, the company and, and referring to that when, when sometimes you, you're getting feedback or you're not sure and making sure that you're, you're pointed in the right direction. Um, but, uh, but having a team around is, is, is also super important in, in bouncing ideas off and, and deciding as a team sometimes if it's, if it's something that is, is more critical. Excellent. Thank you. One more question from the audience. Uh, entrepreneurship often begins with a unique or innovative idea. And all of you have spoken about that uh, in your own trajectories. But what if your idea is actually not that unique or innovative, but it's sort of building on something else it's sort of it's it's not in and of itself um, the unique innovative idea that all of you had how would that affect an entrepreneurial trajectory in your uh, in your opinion michael let me start with you yeah i, I think um this i this kind of notion that great ideas build great companies is i don't think it's true i think most most of the time what you think is unique probably someone else has done before um, and, and you need to learn about what, what worked and what didn't work. Um, but, um, I, you know, I think, um, uh, I can't remember what the question well, was. I, but... I actually recall something you said earlier tonight, and that was that ideas are great, but execution. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, execution, um, executing somebody else's idea can be a form of entrepreneurship in its own right, I guess. And I think, I think John actually mentioned something really great. Like you, you want to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's also key. So um, it's a problem that you want to solve. And, and maybe originally your idea, once you learn more and more about the problem, once you start working on it, maybe that solution that you think is perfect actually will change over time. Interesting. Mike Sullivan, you have a long track record of falling in love with problems. Um, what do you think about somebody who thinks, well, maybe I'm not really an entrepreneur because my idea isn't really all that unique or innovative? I don't think anybody's idea is unique or innovative. I, I fundamentally disagree with, with the question. The premise, yeah, hundred percent. I respect it. I appreciate the question much, but I have a completely different take. I don't think there is such a thing as a new idea. I think the execution is everything. Look at Google. Google didn't invent web search. Um, and, but they perfected it. Um, look where they are today. Any big company you can think of, the idea is not, is, is not new. It's not different. It may be a different spin on something. It may be a different approach or different methodology. There's no such thing as a new idea. It is a hundred percent down to execution. The, the, the surefire way you can tell somebody does not have a good idea is if they want you to sign a non-disclosure agreement before they talk to you about your idea. <laughs> then you can just laugh at them and say that, you know, your idea is it's not worth it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I, I strongly believe that that waiting for that perfect idea is probably what holds people back from being able to get into the swing of things and, and have some of those early learning lessons and, 
hitting the wall a bit early on that sort of lead to things. So um, it's 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 a great point, but and it's a question that that I get a lot. But I, I I really have a very different take on it. Fascinating. Thank you, Nivia. What do you think about the idea that entrepreneurship and a great big idea are one in the same thing? I feel like great idea comes from when you solve the solution, when you try to solve the problem, and then the solution innovative part is a great idea. You can pinpoint that. Before that moment happened, things are fundamentally following the most reasonable way to solve this problem, which I totally agree with Mike. Right. Yeah. And I think for many people listening, this might be quite an interesting and counterintuitive view because, you know, television shows, movies, they always have the idea of, you know, somebody having this wonderful idea. But yeah, the idea, maybe ideas are a dime a dozen. It's actually execution that, that matters, as both Michael and Mike have said. Sarai, your thoughts on this? I 100% I agree with Mike. Uh, and I'm, the first wake up call generally first time entrepreneurs have is that when they realize their great idea is not so great and unique, somebody else has done that before. They just need to know what differentiate themselves. And there are so many uh, examples where people started somewhere that was totally off. For example, Slack, I think they started with a gaming app. Their gaming was, mm. app was horrible, but in the same time, they had developed this great messaging app. They loved it. Before they shut down their company, they said, let's give this another try and see if this is something people want. And turned out everybody wants that. So it's, it's a journey that you walk with your co-founders and you sometimes, the beginning of the journey is finding the right problem. Mm, interesting. Thank you all so very much. Um, thank you to the people in the audience who've contributed questions. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our event and so we're not able to uh, answer all of the questions that have come into the chat, but thank you so much for, uh, for your active contributions from the audience. But let me first and foremost thank our panelists today. Each of you has a unique story and we so appreciate your willingness to share that story with us, the honesty, the warts and all approach that you've brought to all of this and your ability to share your own experiences, I hope will be really impactful for our audience and who knows what entrepreneurial uh, activities may flow from tonight's events. Thank you so much to Sarai, to Livia, to Michael and to Mike and to John for, uh, for being with us this evening and for sharing your thoughts and insights. A special thank you to Laura and Annalise, who were the technical and production minds behind all of this. It might seem simple, and for those of us who are on the panel, it has been really simple, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes in putting an event like this together. So a very big thank you to Laura and to Annalise for all their organizational wherewithal, and to Susan for her leadership in organizing and hosting this event. Thank you so much, Susan. The biggest thanks, however, of course, go to you, our audience. So many of you contributed questions, uh, participated in this evening's event, um, and we're really grateful for your interest in this topic and your active participation. We wish you all the best if you are considering an entrepreneurial future for yourself, and we hope that tonight will give you uh, not only some ideas, but some concrete next steps in terms of people to contact, role models that you might be able to follow and experiences that might help shed a light on what your trajectory might be. Please do reach out to some of the incubators and uh, support services available through the University of Toronto. They are there for you. And uh, most of our panelists have indicated how helpful those U of T support services have been. So please do access them if it's something that you're interested in. And please do stay tuned for future events hosted by the Office of Alumni Relations and the Center for Practice Excellence. We're always interested in your ideas for programming and for idea and for uh, future events. So feel free to share that with us. For now, I'll thank everybody once again for attending. We hope you found tonight a very uh, enjoyable evening. I personally want to thank the uh, entrepreneurs on our panel. Um, I had a great time speaking with all of you. Have a great evening and best wishes for continuing success to all.